Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, presidential lecture of the Econometric Society. Before the actual lecture, uh, there is going to be a few um, certificates um, given to uh, a, a, a few people uh, related to the Econometric Society and uh, Stephen Morris, as president of the society, is going to uh, introduce them. Uh, thank you very much. So um, uh, this, has been, this is a fantastic conference and a fantastic program. And the first uh, thing I have the pleasure to do is to um, award uh, a presentation um, from the uh, program chairs of the uh, econometric society meetings, uh, Zvika Niemann and Raffaella Giacomini, who have done a fantastic job of putting together the program that we've seen so far, and it looks fantastic going forward, so I'd like to actually just give a round of applause to them and the rest of the program. And one of the jobs of them and the program committee is to uh, give a prize for the best um, young researchers, for papers for the best young researchers who are attending the conference uh, in applied economics, uh, broadly defined, which basically means not pure theory and not pure uh, econometrics. And um, the awards this year go to uh, uh, Dan Garrett of the Toulouse School of Economics for uh, his, his work on payoff implications of incentives contracting, and to uh, Alexander Tortovsky of the University of Chicago for his work on uh, non-parametric estimates of demand in the California Health Insurance Exchange. And I'd like to ask them both. Econometric Society is a fantastic international society, and as some of you uh, may know, and some of you may not know, it's a slightly elitist society. It's actually it's an organization that is run by uh, its fellows, and uh, it's very exciting when we add to our fellowship every year. And um, today I have the uh, honor of um, giving out a fellowship to certificate to Fabienne Postel-Vinay, who's been elected to the society. I'd like to just read you the um, uh, nominating statement. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Stay there, stay there while we talk about you. Um, Poste Vinay's research has strongly contributed to gaining a better understanding of labor markets and more particularly of markets affected by trading frictions. The contribution is both theoretical and empirical and encompasses micro and macroeconomic approaches. His microeconometric work offers new ways to model wage bargaining and on the job search that allows for structural estimation with matched employer-employee data. His macroeconomic work proposes a macro-dynamic extension of wage posting model that sheds new light on the dynamics of the cross-sectional distribution of firm sizes. His most recent research tends to export his knowledge of search and matching models to other types of markets, such as internet sales. So congratulations. Okay, so uh, after uh, these um, events, it's now uh, time for the lecture, and, uh, but I would like to say a few words about the speaker first. It's an honor and a privilege uh, for me to introduce uh, Stephen Morris. Uh, he is um, professor of economics at MIT as of July 1st uh, this year, and he was previously at Princeton, Yale, at um, Penn. He has been very closely associated to the Econometric Society for um, many years. He was elected fellow in 2002. He was the main editor of Econometrica between 2007 and 2011. He was uh, a member of the council between 2008 and 2000 and 
2014, I think, and then in 2017, he was elected second vice president, became first uh, vice president last year, and finally he is the current president of the society. Uh, on top of, of the uh, membership and, and uh, presidency of the um, Econometric Society, he's a member of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, has, vis has ha uh, held many visiting positions uh, but um, he is uh, obviously best known for his contributions. He's a very distinguished uh, economic theorist. He has worked on a, a broad um, and impressive range of topics. He is very well known for his work on, uh, in, in, in game theory. He has covered many topics there, including uh, purification, which is a title that I find uh, particularly attractive, uh, but he is uh, best uh, known perhaps for uh, his work on global games, and uh, he has um, a very influential paper with uh, Hyun Shin uh, that uh, showcases the relevance of uh, what uh, might seem like a very abstract uh, equilibrium selection mechanism for a very important uh, empirical uh, topic. And uh, he's also made very important contributions to mechanism uh, design in which he has uh, relaxed some of the common knowledge assumptions that uh, the literature typically makes. His talk today is going to push the uh, research frontier even further by revisiting the foundations of uh, game theory with incomplete information. I had the uh, fortune to attend an earlier uh, presentation of his of the uh, essentially the same material at the um, Asia meetings of the Econometric Society about a couple of months ago. And, um, and I can assure you that those of you who are not uh, experts in the area will be talking about the paper for the next few th uh, days, and those who are, are going to be citing it for many years. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much. So, so yes, the topic is coordination and complete information. So uh, first item of the title is coordination. So we know that coordination is really important. Lots of economic and social environments have an element of coordination or strategic complementarity. So when a fixed exchange rate is under attack, speculative, speculators have a greater incentive to short the currency if they think other speculators are going to sell. When a bank has taken a loss, depositors have more incentive to withdraw their deposits if they think other people are withdrawing their deposits. When an economy is in recession, a firm has uh, more of an incentive to postpone investment if they think other firms will, um, will postpone investment, uh, and so on. So, so, uh, uh, so this is generally important. Uh, and so, so it's important for applications, understanding coordination and and uh, strategic complementarities. And so if we want to model a strategic situation like this, for purposes of my talk, I'm going to talk about a toy example. So I'll talk about this toy example for my talk today. Uh, the, um, the things that I'm talking about will uh, be relevant for richer models, where people have written lots of richer models that explain all those uh, phenomena that I mentioned on the previous slide in richer models of coordination games for purposes of giving this general talk, we'll just talk about a simple game, okay? So it's when it's modeled as a game, we know that we know very well that in a game, strategic complementarities, these coordination incentives, uh, give rise to multiple equilibria, okay? So in our, our famous two by two game, uh, I've just normalized payoffs, so you suppose there's one action, let's call it not invest, gives you a payoff of zero, and there's another action, let's call it invest, where, uh, if you invest and the other player invests, you get a payoff of two. If the other player doesn't invest, you get a payoff of minus one. So this gives rise to multiple equilibria. There's an equilibrium where both invest and an equilibrium where, don't, where, where both don't invest, okay? 
So this is the simple uh, type of situation that can arise in coordination games. So um, for game theorists, I'm a game theorist, so one generic response that you, can, you could give is you could say, well, let's look for some all-purpose theory of equilibrium selection based on some uh, uh, axiomatic or, or other principles that might explain why one equilibrium or, or, or the other gets selected, okay? Uh, but here's a more, uh, maybe more nuanced response, is if you say, well, you had these two equilibria here, but the multiplicity is a little bit an artifact of a convenient and pervasive assumption that we make, but, but maybe counterfactual assumption in practice, uh, the assumption that there's common knowledge of payoffs, which means we as modelers, not just in that two by two game, but you know, when we're doing more complicated models of currency attacks or whatever, we find it convenient to model the situation to assume that there's common knowledge of the payoffs among the players, uh, but that sort of, Intuitively, it biases the conclusion towards multiplicity because, you know, it creates the possibility because there's common knowledge of payoffs, it makes it easier for you to simultaneously have everybody switch from one action to the other. It makes it more stable to support multiple equilibria. So it's a natural question to ask what happens if you relax common knowledge assumptions. An intuition that's going to be relevant for my talk today, an intuition that might favor the invest-invest equilibrium in this example is that uh, as a practical matter, we think that there's going to be what is sometimes called strategic uncertainty, that is uncertainty in equilibrium of what the other player is going to do. There might be strategic uncertainty where you don't know what the other player is going to do. Suppose you had a 50-50, suppose you assigned a 50-50 chance to the other player investing in that example, this was the game, you remember. In that example, if you thought there was a 50% chance that the other player was going to invest, a 50% chance not invest, two and minus one, you're gonna to want to invest, okay? And indeed, this is broadly consistent with experimental evidence of how people play, play games for what it's worth, okay? But, uh, so that's an intuition, but uh, it raises the question, how should we think about relaxing common knowledge assumptions uh, in general. When we write down models, we're usually making some common knowledge assumptions. Uh, how should we think about relaxing them? Uh, terminology, which, is, um, which was very important a few years ago, and people maybe are a little bit more informal in thinking it, but now is incomplete information, a situation where there really is no uh, common knowledge assumptions. Uh, how do you deal with incomplete information? Okay, so that was the second part of my title, was incomplete information. Okay, so the, the, what I want to do in this talk is try and talk somewhat uh, informally, incidentally, but uh, talk about the idea that um, uh, we should take incomplete information seriously, by which I mean relaxing common knowledge assumptions in important ways uh, in applied economic modeling. Okay, this is something that we should think harder about, and we've been a little... Uh, people have been a little distracted by it for various reasons, okay? So in order to make this point, uh, what I plan to do is give a little uh, historical perspective on modeling incomplete information, okay? So I think that this is uh, probably material that's well known to some, certainly to some theorists. It's better known if you're in graduate school uh, as I was, in the late 80s or early 90s. It's less well known to people who've been in graduate school in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and I think it's worth reviewing, okay? And it's, I'm gonna talk about, and in fact, it's not gonna be a technical talk, uh, but at some level it's going to be a conceptual talk, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it is that we use type spaces to model incomplete information and exactly what is the justification for doing so uh, this language, type spaces, the, the, the exact details of, in, of incomplete information modeling, um, are some, you know, the, the interpretation is sometimes um, a little unclear. Okay? So, as I said, I want to, uh, you know, my, my purpose in the talk is I want to try and uh, give us a slightly abstract plea that, you, that people do make more... Um, uh, common knowledge assumptions than maybe they realize they're doing, and you can relax them more than maybe you realize, and that there are d directions that you can go. Okay, and then I want to come back 
to, um, and at the end of the talk, and, and uh, experience tells me I don't have time to talk about a lot of things, so uh, I'm not going to talk about a lot of things. To, so to illustrate, I'm going to come back to coordination games, uh, talk a little bit about global games, and talk about uh, a recent work which gives a more uh, serious incomplete, inter incomplete information interpretation of global games uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so now we're going to do incomplete information and come back to coordination. All right. All right, so let's, let's talk about terminology for a second. Sorry about that, but it's kind of useful. And this uh, history of this use of terminology is, I, I think, kind of important in some ways, OK? So in um, 1944, von Neumann and Morgenstern wrote The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. And in their book, they introduced a um, tripartite distinction between different informational environments for uh, game theorists or analyzing a game, terminology which was um, uh, standard for uh, 40 years or something, and people are a little bit more muddled about it recently, but which seemed like an important uh, um, uh, trichotomy uh, of analyzing uh, informational assumptions, okay? And they did it in game theory. I, I, could, I could do this same distinction, more, this same classification more broadly um, in talking about economic models more generally, okay? But the distinction that they made was between perfect information games, okay? And informally, this is where you make the assumption that there's common knowledge of the structure of the game being played, okay? So you know what the players are, you know the orders in which they move, you know what the previous moves were, you know what the payoffs are, and all this is common knowledge among the players, okay? Common knowledge, by the way, was not um, in use as a technical term that it's now been formally introduced into economic theorist language, but this is clearly what they meant, the common knowledge in the sense that everybody knew it, everybody knew that everybody knew it, and so on, okay? So that's private information games. The famous leading example would be chess. Okay. But they also talked about situations that were called complete but imperfect information. Okay. What's complete but imperfect information? This would be a situation where there's common knowledge of the structure of the game being played, meaning we know who the players are, we know what the rules of the game are, we know what the feasible strategies are, we know what the payoffs are as a function of everything that happens, but there could be some uncertainty. Okay. So you could be uncertain of the past or current actions of other players, you could be uncertain about some, there could be some exogenous uncertainty, so there could be uncertainty about some moves of nature, okay? That's complete but perfect information, okay? Leading example, poker, okay? You're playing poker, you don't know what the hand of the dealer has, so there is imperfect information, but the rules are perfectly clear. They drew the cards from a deck, et cetera, et cetera. So you, there is common knowledge of the structure of the game, okay? But there's also incomplete information, okay? Incomplete in information is a situation where you couldn't describe what the structure of the game is, where there is not common knowledge of the structure of the game being played, okay? So what would be a leading example? Well, the leading example for these guys was most economic environments of interest, okay? There's not going to be common knowledge of the rules of the game. There's not going to be common knowledge of the structure that you're in. And um, that may be a little bit of a joke, but they were, very, they were very serious about that, okay? So here's von Neumann and Morgenstern. We cannot avoid the assumption that all subjects under consideration are completely informed about the physical characteristics of the situation in which they operate. Luce and Rafer, these, this was the leading textbook of game theory, uh, in the early years of game theory. The theory assumes complete knowledge on the part of the player of a complex situation where experience indicates that a human being would be far more restricted in his perceptions. The immediate reaction of the empiricist tends to be that since such assumptions are so at variance with known fact, there is little point to the theory except as a mathematical exercise, okay? And remember that broadly speaking, for 30 years after um, game theory was introduced, that kind of was, broadly speaking, the reaction to game theory, that it was, it applied to these situations and it couldn't be applied uh, more broadly, 
Okay? So an important um, uh, development was John Hassani. So in, in 1967, 68, uh, John Hassani published a series of papers uh, in management science in which he made an argument that he made an extremely important argument that suggests that in a certain sense, incomplete information is not a problem. Okay? Uh, to be more precise, he made an argument that we can, uh, we can incorporate any degree of incomplete information in our, in our analysis um, without loss of generality. Okay? Um, he got a piece of the first Nobel Prize in economics. Um, but, I'm sorry, the first Nobel Prize awarded to game theorists uh, for this observation. This was the contribution for which you got the Nobel Prize. Uh, arguably, it was a precursor to the game theory takeover of economic theory. Sorry, maybe that's too strong a claim. But the, the, um, uh, you know, the fact that now, uh, so, you know, the Nobel Prize uh, citation emphasized the importance of this development in allowing uh, game theory to be applied, okay? Uh, uh, so it's a pretty big deal, okay? So uh, let me tell you what the observation was, because as I keep repeating, I think it's a little lost in time exactly what these issues are, and I'm going to tell you why there's a little bit of a problem with how it gets interpreted. Okay, so let me just review what his contribution is. At a, at, you know, at a, at a high level. Okay, so he said, look, suppose there's some set of states that we care about, theta. Suppose that there are some players, let's say two, uh, Ann and Bob. Uh, here's the observation. I, the, you know, the contribution is the idea that I'm just going to introduce these abstract objects called types. That was the contribution, the idea of uh, saying that we're going to analyze this situation by hypothesizing some abstract set of types, types for Anne, TA, and types for Bob, TB. And then we can construct a type space where, uh, given these types, we're going to say for each type of Anne, uh, part of the description of the type is some belief over the types of Bob and the state of the world. Okay? And for Bob, there's similarly a description of, for each type of Bob, what's the beliefs over the types of Anne and the state of the world. That's what a type space is, okay? Now, why was this language novel and helpful, okay? Well, the types remind us they're very much, they're going to be somewhat like the hand in poker. Remember, we said that we could already deal with imperfect information, you know, not knowing something, one player knowing something that other players don't know. So types are going to have the feature that we're going to assume that Anne knows her type and Bob does not know her type, so in that sense, it's like a hand in poker. It's private information to the player. Okay? Why this was a conceptual innovation relative to those games of complete but imperfect information that people were, were modeling before is that unlike a hand in poker, there didn't need to be any uh, claim that this type had any physical counterpart in the world or that there was some uh, stage before you found out what your type was. These types were being introduced just as a conceptual device, just as a language to encode uh, the incomplete information that players might have. Okay? By proposing that we might use abstract type spaces to encode things, uh, it allowed for a formal way of dealing with incomplete information. Okay? So because we don't put any prior structure on type spaces, they could be used to model all kinds of incomplete information, in particular, all kinds of uh, beliefs and higher order beliefs. Okay? So why could they do that? Well, you know, theta, this underlying state space that you care about, it can incorporate uncertainty about payoffs, but you could also embed all kinds of payoffs about the rules of the game and so on. That can be embedded in theta. Okay? But more importantly, by saying that we have these abstract types, not physical hands out there in the world or physical signals. We have these abstract types. You could, within these types, embed any beliefs and higher order beliefs. So any incomplete information you want uh, could be incorporated in these types. Okay? 
Uh, in fact, there's a whole theory that some theorists know about that isn't relevant for this argument. You can, act, you can construct the so-called universal type space that embeds, that's a description of all the beliefs and higher order beliefs that a player might have. So uh, in that sense, you can make really concrete the fact that you can use type spaces to relax common knowledge assumptions and have any beliefs in higher order beliefs. Okay, so that's a contribution. That's what he got the Nobel Prize for. That's what uh, um, um, that's what dealt with that conceptual problem that we had before, that we had a theory that dealt with complete and imperfect information, uh, but couldn't deal with incomplete information. Hassani said, just conceptualize it by thinking about these type spaces. Uh, use that to model what players think about other players and so on. Use the old technology that we had for games of imperfect information, and bingo, we're done, okay? So it's an important uh, con contribution of Hassani, okay? The good news is, is that he did show, okay? I just gave you two slides, but I would argue that if you study it carefully, he really did make an argument why you can dispense with common knowledge assumptions completely and analyze games of incomplete information with the same tools that we're using to analyze games of complete information, okay? He provided the link to take the conceptual apparatus that you had before, and you can extend it to work with incomplete information. However, I feel that there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of what Hassani did, that somehow the, uh, the effect seems to have been a little, to some extent, the wrong lessons are drawn sometimes. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So let's call it the bad news. The bad news is that after Hassani, the economic profession went straight back to making the very strong common knowledge assumptions that seemed completely problematic to von Neumann, Morgenstern, and Luce Reifer, why they said that it's really not easy to apply this to economics, okay? You know, what's going on here? The logical possibility of relaxing common knowledge assumptions doesn't mean that people actually did analysis where they relax the common knowledge assumptions. You know, Hassani has shown that it's possible to relax the common knowledge assumptions, but nobody actually did it. What they actually did was go back to write down models where you were making very strong assumptions. You, you really allowed very stylized forms of asymmetric information. Um, and in fact, very strong common knowledge assumptions were getting buried, okay? That at least is the thesis that I want to suggest, okay? So that's a misunderstanding. Okay, so let's just contrast it, this abstract type spaces that I described, with what um, is the uh, uh, typical modeling approach, so what we might call the asymmetric information approach, the approach where we're not appealing to Hassani, just the more, the more uh, standards straightforward description of asymmetric information that you might see, uh, and, and then I'll talk about what I mean by implicit common knowledge assumptions. Okay, so the more standard thing you might be taught, suppose we stick to the case where there are two players, Anne and Bob. Well, the standard thing you might see if you're seeing some modeling of a situation where there was imperfect information, more standard modeling might be to say, well, uh, Anne has some payoffs, so maybe there's uncertainty about Anne's payoffs, so we might embed her payoffs, a parameter for her payoffs, might be the, her value of an object or something, call that theta A, and uh, similarly, there might be some payoff uh, type for Bob, so there's some parameter theta B that embeds, that, that represents Bob's payoffs. Okay, so the uncertainty is about Anne's payoffs and Bob's payoffs. Okay, so cross product. Okay, then, what do we typically do? We assume a common prior over what there's uncertainty about, Anne's, type, Anne's payoff type and Bob's payoff type. And then what do we do? We assume that any type of Anne has some beliefs about Bob's type and Bob's beliefs about Anne's types are derived from the common prior by Bayes updating. Okay, that, this, would be a, this would be a more typical way that we proceed which looks a little different. This seems to be making a lot of assumptions. It's making a ton of common knowledge assumptions, 
when a student first sees it in the graduate class, they think this is some crazy strong common knowledge assumptions. And you know, you might see someone waving their hands, well, it's okay, Hassan, you said you can incorporate any incomplete information you want. But, but you're still actually, if you stick with, it's true that you can incorporate any incomplete information you want, but if you actually continue with the standard asymmetric information model like this, you're still making a lot of assumptions, okay? So just to spell out what are the key implicit common knowledge assumptions you're making. Well, if you did this, what I just described here, you're assuming that players know their own payoffs, which is one thing. You're assuming that each payoff of a player, so let's say for Anne, each payoff for Anne, each theta A, each her value of the object, say, is uniquely associated with her type. Okay, now that wasn't what Hassani did. Hassani said you could construct these big type spaces that could be constructed with anything, but it's a, it's a built-in assumption, the way things are often modeled, that you're uniquely associating a type with, a, uh, with his payoffs, okay, which is a very strong assumption. Okay, in fact, it corresponds to an assumption a restriction on second order beliefs. Okay? We often make the independence assumption. Okay? If, we, if we assume that that prior was independent, then in fact what you're assuming, another way of describing independence would be to say it's common knowledge of second order beliefs. Okay? I know there's common knowledge what Bob's beliefs about Anne's types are. It doesn't depend on anything. That means there's common knowledge of that. That is the implicit common knowledge assumption. Okay? Our program chair, Zvika Neiman emphasized in some of his work that in mechanism design, independence often gets relaxed to allow types to be correlated, but they often do it where you're maintaining this type of structure. So you have payoff types theta A and theta B, and if you do that, it's an implication that once you know a player's beliefs about the other player's types, you can deduce his preferences. Okay? There's a one-to-one -one map between the two. Okay? He called it belief determined preferences. Okay? Well, the fact is that people doing it didn't think that that's what they were assuming. They didn't, they didn't conceptualize what they were doing when they wrote down the type space like this and they allowed types to be correlated. They didn't think their objective was to assume that beliefs determine preferences, but that's what it does. That's what the implicit common knowledge assumption is. Okay? So either way, it's assuming away high order beliefs. Okay? Another critical assumption. Um, that may be more, I mean, people may more explicitly say that they are going to assume the common prior assumption, that everybody's beliefs are, are derived from the same prior, but a subtlety, which perhaps is not appreciated, is that if it really is the case that players observe signals and there's common knowledge of the structure by which they observe signals, then it's a reasonable justification for the common prior assumption to say, well, suppose everybody initially believed the same thing and then they observe signals. But if you actually think that there's incomplete information and you want to justify using type spaces via the argument of Hassani, which I just gave you a two slide summary of, then there is no justification for assuming the common prior assumption for that reason because there is no uh, situation before you knew your type. Your type is just a way of embedding incomplete information, so that, that can't be the justification for the common prior assumption. And um, uh, yeah, people have worked on how would you, what are the alternative justifications of the common prior assumption, but I won't get into that. Okay, so why, okay, so I think that it's an interesting research agenda to uh, uh, think about incomplete information, that it would be good for applied economists to think about incomplete information more seriously, to say those common knowledge assumptions that you intuitively feel are very problematic whenever you write down the model. They really are problematic, but there really is a way of relaxing them because Hassan, you showed us how to do it. You just gotta work at it a little bit, okay? So it would be good to revisit incomplete information, recognizing that implicit common knowledge assumptions are a real issue. Okay, so for theorists, that kind of means um, make, uh, you know, note what are the implicit common knowledge, there are implicit common knowledge assumptions in the way you write down the type space. It would be good to make them more explicit. Okay, for applied economists, uh, allow, you know, don't think that uncertainty about other people's beliefs is some exotic theorists 
uh, invention or something. Uh, it really is something that uh, can and should be taken uh, seriously in applied work. Okay, so my ambition when I thought about taking this talk, when I thought about giving uh, this talk, is that I thought I would present some um, fantastic unified framework of ways of um, pursuing this agenda. Um, but I, I don't really have a unified approach. I just think there are a bunch of different things that you can do. I've done a bunch of different things. Other people have done a bunch of different things. Uh, so I'm just, so, you know, one thing that you can do is you can relax the common prior assumption. I think that's a very natural thing to do. Uh, it's worth highlighting the fact that the, um, there's a strong connection between relaxing the, co the common prior assumption and um, relaxing the equilibrium assumption. Okay, equilibrium assumptions build in the common prior assumption. If you assume, if you want to relax the assumption that there's common knowledge of the structure of the model that you're in, that means that even if you did assume equilibrium, your predictions would be much weaker and would correspond to weaker solution concepts um, like iterated dominance. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of work so, so there's a bunch of work that could be um, rationalized by wanting to relax implicit common knowledge assumptions. Okay, another thing that you can do is, but there, there are independent justifications for the common prior assumption, why you might want to maintain it. Uh, you, could, you can maintain the common knowledge assumption, but allow for the possibility that the analyst, an outside observer, or the econometrician doesn't know what the information structure is. Okay, it is a really uh, big problem with taking incomplete information seriously, which is that if you do think that incomplete information is a little richer than, um, than the simple ways that uh, economic models often assume, if you think that's the case, the bad news is, is that it's a particularly hard thing to observe. Okay, Hassani introduced this tool of type spaces that allowed for the possibility of complicated beliefs and higher order beliefs, but they clearly are particularly hard to identify observable counterparts for those things, okay? So that suggests that what you would like to do is um, allow for richer type spaces, okay? Relaxing common knowledge assumption is all about allowing for richer type spaces allowing for the possibility, even maintaining the common prior assumption, that the analyst or econometrician does not know what the information structure is, so the details of the information structure are unknown. So a bunch of recent work that I've been doing with Dirk Bergerman uh, and other co-authors have been going in this direction um, where we, uh, um, we're pushing it. Um, we've been arguing that it should be relevant for econometricians. A few people are doing stuff now. I think it's... Uh, uh, this could really be um, uh, this could really be an exciting direction. But I, what I wanted to mention today is uh, 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 within this agenda is just going back to coordination games. Okay, so I want to talk about coordination games and incomplete information. It is going to relate back to the global games literature in a little bit. Uh, you can kind of think of it as uh, so. This is based on some recent work with Hyun Sung Shin and Mohammed Yildiz. Um, and we can think of it as uh, um, thinking about, in the light of this discussion of incomplete information, uh, reinterpreting uh, and motivating uh, global games analysis. Okay? All right, so this is part three, I guess. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back to that game that we started with, that two by two game that we started with. But let's generalize it a tiny bit. Let's take that two by two game that I started with, but now let's generalize it to a one, let's add in a one dimensional parameter. Suppose our two players are choosing whether to invest or not invest. Suppose that the cost of investment is one always. You always pay a cost one to investing but you get a return theta, which is an unknown parameter, uh, but you get this return only if the other player invests. So there's strategic complementarities um, uh, because of that. Okay, so if theta was equal to three, then this would be exactly the game that I started the talk with, right? Where you get two, 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 minus one, zero, and so on. 
Okay? So I've just taken that game that we started with, where there was common knowledge of payoffs, it was 2 2, and now we've allowed for the possibility of relaxing the common knowledge of payoffs assumption by um, uh, parameterizing it by theta. And now the question is how do we, how do we uh, uh, incorporate incomplete information in this example? Okay? Let me just note that in this parameterization, in this one parameter game, invest is risk dominant, is a, is a game theorist term. Uh, invest is risk dominant, uh, meaning a best response if you put a 50 50 chance on invest and not invest, only if theta is at least two. Okay? So in that sense, invest becomes more stable, robust to strategic uncertainty when theta is bigger than two. Okay? So suppose we want to start with this game and we want to relax the common knowledge assumption. What can we say about that? Okay? Suppose you are uh, Luce and Rafer or von Neumann Morgenstern and they were coming back and you said, well, now we know how to model this. We know how to talk about relaxing the common knowledge assumptions. What can we tell you? Okay? Well, there's actually a large uh, game theory literature. Um, an important reference is the email game of Rubenstein, of uh, Ariel Rubenstein. Um, uh, some recent, uh, a, a more recent paper of Weinstein and Yildiz, um, that actually it turns out that if you relax the common knowledge assumption in certain ways that seem reasonably intuitive, okay, if you said, look, suppose it was the case that everybody was almost sure that theta was equal to three, uh, everybody was almost sure that everybody else was almost sure that theta was equal to three. You can relax the common knowledge assumption in some intuitive ways, okay, but it's not going to deliver the prediction that you play um, the risk dominant outcome invest. In fact, you could get anything to be played, okay? So if you've been following this literature, the lesson of this uh, common knowledge literature is that actually relaxing common knowledge assumptions, at least in the way that first occurs to you in the, the, the formally in the product topology, uh, actually it, it, it's not going to, it could go either way, uh, depending on the fine details of how you relax the common knowledge assumption, okay? So in that sense, we should take that to be a uh, vindication for von Neumann, Morgenstern, and Luce Rafer, uh, saying that uh, uh, actually, you know, you can't relax common knowledge assumptions. Uh, you really need some common knowledge assumptions to get anywhere, okay? This is a big oversimplification, but that's kind of what you might, what I think should be the takeaway from a large literature in which you say, what can we say about the sensitivity to higher order beliefs, okay? So, but here's what I think your reaction should be. The reaction should be, uh, so, so that says that, you know, on the one hand, so, so what do we conclude? You could allow for this rich thought set of relaxations of common knowledge assumptions that say anything could happen, or we could be stuck in the world where you have to assume common knowledge of payoffs, or you have to assume typical type of common knowledge assumptions that people make. Well, I want to suggest an alternative, of course, which is to see whether there are some alternative assumptions which are um, intermediate, uh, we've got to make some common knowledge assumptions, otherwise we won't be able to say anything, but are there any intermediate assumptions that are going to have any interesting implications? Okay? So here are some alternative assumptions that you could make. Suppose you made an assumption about a player's rank belief. Okay? So I'm talking about this two-player two example today. So a player's rank belief is the probability, uh, so let's define a player's rank belief to, the, to be the probability that she assigns to being more optimistic about theta than the other player, okay? Having a higher expectation of theta than the other player, okay? So formally, the rank of type T of Anne's type TA is the probability that uh, TA assigns to her expectation of TA being less than her expectation. So sorry, I, I wrote this the wrong way. Yeah, the other way around, whatever. Okay, so your rank belief is the probability that you assign 
the case I'm interested in is where it's uniform, so it doesn't matter which way I wrote the inequality, okay? So suppose we said, let's instead of doing what you usually do of assuming some independent types or something like that instead, let's just focus on rank beliefs, this different way of thinking. It's, some, it's an assumption about higher order beliefs, but it's a particular assumption about higher order beliefs. Suppose we just assumed that players had a, uh, uh, suppose we focused attention on, out of all the possible um, um, characteristics of a type, we focused on this one variable which is going to turn out to be important, which is what is their rank belief? What's the probability that a type assigns to having a uh, higher expectation of theta than the other player? Yeah, it is supposed to be the other way around. Okay, so that's the uniform rank belief. Okay? So here's an alternative common knowledge assumption you can make. It is a common knowledge assumption, but let's be explicit about it and let's see what it is. You could assume that there's, suppose you assume there was common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs. Okay, so that would say every type of Anne had a rank belief of a half, and you can make a similar assumption for Bob. Okay, so this is just an alternative assumption that you could make about how they look at the world. Okay, it has the property that this is defined in an arbitrary type space, okay? It doesn't have to do with assuming that there's um, a particular type space, okay? It is well defined, it is meaningful on the universal type space. You can identify which of those types for which there's common knowledge of rank beliefs or approximate uniform knowledge of rank beliefs, okay? So it's comparable to, in its specificity, the types of assumptions that you might make, that you might more commonly make, um, assuming uh, complete information or assuming independent types. It just doesn't happen to be the ones that we usually make, but it's going to be a relevant one, okay? Because it turns out to be the case that if you make just this uh, simple assumption, I, and I would argue easily interpretable assumption, uh, conceivably testable assumption, it has an implication, okay? If there was common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs, then it is the case that players would choose risk-dominant actions, okay? That is, Anne would invest when her expectation of theta was greater than two, and she would not invest when her expectation of theta was less than two, okay? Uh, it's not a complicated proof, actually, although I didn't, I didn't write it down here. Uh, it's not a complicated proof. You just say, um, uh, so by the way, this is true in equilibrium on any type space. It's also true if you look at rationalizability, iterated deletion of strictly dominated strategies. Uh, it's not a complicated argument. You just say, what is the highest expectation for any type of any player at which it is rationalizable to not invest, okay? And you say, suppose that highest type was not equal to two, then you argue by contradiction that if you're the marginal type with that expectation, you're, you know, you're, you at most have a 50-50 probability, so it can't be a best response. Sorry, it's not a complicated argument, but I'm not sure that will explain that. But anyway, this is the result. All right. So if there's common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs, then you have to be choosing a risk-dominant action. Okay? Uh, this, uh, and this generalizes um, to arbitrary many-player symmetric payoff games, okay? So suppose you had many, uh, a finite or continuum of players, um, supermodular payoffs, so your gain to investing is increasing in the number of other players investing. Uh, suppose we defined your rank belief to be your belief about the number of players who have a lower expectation of theta than you have, and then uniform rank beliefs is having a uniform distribution over the proportion of players with a lower expectation, then the result generalizes. If there's common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs, then players will be choosing what we call a Laplacian action. Player I will be investing if and only if it's a best response to a uniform belief over the number of other players investing. So that little two by two example generalizes to many player two action games, okay? So these are results that you can show, okay? So these results that you can show, let me skip that. These results that you can show are uh, 
extremely closely related to or reinterpretations of work on global games in the last um, uh, a large body of work on so-called global games. Okay. So um, let me give a for those of you who haven't seen global games, let me give a two-slide summary of the key results in global games over the last 25 years and relate it back to what I just told you. Okay, what I just told you was a different perspective on the global games literature. It would be one way of describing it. Okay, so Carlson Van Dam wrote a remarkable paper in uh, 1993 called Global Games and Equilibrium Selection. Okay, now the approach was very much in the um, style of the classic asymmetric information model that I mentioned, that I talked about. It was classical common prior asymmetric information analysis. Um, so, uh, so suppose we analyzed my two by two game, but instead we'd done not what I just did, we'd, suppose we'd done something different. Okay, what we could have done is said, look, suppose the state theta, this parameter theta, has some smooth commonly known prior distribution. Suppose we said that each player, Ann and Bob, I is Ann and Bob, observed a noisy signal of theta. So their signal xi was equal to theta plus noise, where epsilon i was some iid noise terms, and sigma is a parameter that measures how big the noise is. Okay, and suppose we said that Ann observed her signal xa and on the basis of XA and that prior and that distribution of noise, she formed, a, by Bayes updating, she formed a conjecture about theta and XB by Bayes updating. Okay, and similarly for Bob. Okay, this is, the, this is the, an example, uh, a special case of the global game model that Carlson Van Dam wrote down. Okay. Now suppose that the prior, this probability distribution on theta, on the state of the world, suppose the prior was uniform, then I claim there will be common knowledge of rank beliefs. Okay, this property that I defined, that, that you, uh, whatever your type, you think there's a 50-50 chance that the other guy is more pessimist, more, more optimistic or less optimistic. If the prior is uniform, there will be uh, common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs. Okay, you can do the algebra. The simple way to see it is that if the prior is uniform, you observe a signal, there's nothing about the level of your signal that is going to make you, you know, if you, if you hadn't observed your signal, you would think that your, your noise is IID draw, so there's nothing that says that mine is higher than yours. But observing the draw, if the prior is uniform, the level of your signal, that doesn't tell you anything about whether your signal is higher or lower. So you'll have a 50-50 chance whether his signal is higher or lower, okay? So if the prior was uniform, you would have common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs. In fact, if the prior was smooth, it doesn't have to be uniform. If the prior was smooth, which is the assumption that I said, if the prior was smooth but sigma was small, remember there was a parameter by which we scaled the noise. Uh, if the noise was small, then in fact, you will approximate common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs. Why is that the case? Well, if sigma is small, then locally it's kind of like the prior is almost uniform because if sigma is small, your noise is occurring just on the, you're just looking at when you're updating, you know that theta is in the neighborhood, uh, in the same neighborhood. And as that neighborhood shrinks, if the prior is uniform, it's uh, getting flatter and flatter. Okay, so if the prior is smooth and sigma is very small, there's approximate common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, and that's actually, so they showed that you play, you know, in this case, in a symmetric two by two game, you would be playing the risk dominant equilibrium. Okay, so, so the argument that I said is, uh, applies. So that, but their result was significantly generalized and applied in a wide variety of settings. And in fact, um, uh, most of, if you have seen global game applications, most of them concern the binary action symmetric payoff case where people are choosing binary actions and there's symmetry across players. 
and the action that got played was the Laplacian action that I mentioned earlier, what you do if you have a uniform belief over the proportion of people who are more optimistic. Okay, so why did I tell you all this? Well, because I wanted to make a contrast between a classical asymmetric information analysis and what I think of as a more incomplete information interpretation that I just gave you. Okay, so with the classical information interpretation, players are observing signals of the state according to a common prior distribution, a very specific common prior distribution. Okay, so their types or signals are drawn according to this prior distribution. And it's assumed that there's common knowledge of the structure of signals and the common prior. Okay, another strong assumption. There's common knowledge of all that structure. Okay? Surely those assumptions are a met. So I wrote a lot of papers like this. Okay? Now surely when we made those assumptions, it wasn't that we thought that there was common knowledge of the distribution of noise and you know, all the ingredients of that model. Okay? It's a very specific story, but it's surely intended to be a metaphor. Uh, certainly when I started thinking about these issues with Hyun, we were very consciously thinking about trying to relax implicit common knowledge assumptions to allow for richer type spaces, and we certainly didn't take it literally. Okay? Um, there is a danger, though, that you take these metaphors too seriously. Okay? I think, actually, if you look at some of the global games literature, it kind of is taking the specific story where there's common knowledge of the structure of noise and so on. Uh, you take it too literally. Okay? So, an alternative perspective is to say, maybe we shouldn't be so uh, hung up on the asymmetric information story. That story looks good because it looks more like the type of models that people are more used to writing down. It looks more standard stuff, okay? But actually, what really matters is just the rank beliefs assumption that you get out at the end of the day, okay? Either that assumption is good or it's not good, and whether you, uh, and it surely does, whether you think it's a good assumption, surely doesn't rest on whether you think common knowledge of the structure of signals makes sense. It's the rank beliefs assumption itself, you would think, that, uh, that really matters. Okay? It captures what is really important uh, for the results. Okay? So actually, we always knew that. We did recently write a paper just to formalize that, just to make the point that you can understand the message independent of uh, uh, the particular asymmetric information story that was giving that. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's coordination. One um, observation that I want to make that is sort of um, important, I think, for convincing applied economists to take this seriously is that, you know, one message is that if you want to relax common knowledge assumptions, it is equivalent to allowing for richer type spaces, which creates, I feel, a little bit of tension, okay? Because if you want to um, allow for richer type spaces in order to make fewer common knowledge assumptions, um, people feel that it's demanding more of the players. It's making the players more sophisticated, okay? I don't think it is, okay? You just take the same assumptions that you're making before, but relax the common knowledge assumptions, allow for more higher order uncertainty. Um, but uh, I don't know, that's the, that's the reaction that people have, okay? Um, it's worth highlighting that as always, the analysis um, could be as if. So if I take that global game analysis that I just did, you could say, and maybe this was implicit in what I said, but let me now make it explicit. Um, one implication is that um, you could naively assume, just going back to the coordination game, you could just naively assume that players sit there and they always have a uniform belief over the proportion of other players that are going to invest or not invest. That's a behavioral assumption that is not grounded in analysis of rational play in a game. That would just be a naive behavioral assumption, 
Okay? It is an implication of the analysis that if there was common knowledge of uniform rank beliefs, that naive sounding behavior actually would be consistent with equilibrium. Okay? So it's actually very simple to implement. Okay? You can also give it a learning foundation, actually. So, um, uh, yeah, so in that sense, uh, we should understand that it's not too sophisticated. Okay? So, um, so let me conclude. So on the issue of coordination rank beliefs, I want to say that global game analysis in general and the assumption of common knowledge of rank beliefs, I don't think should be seen as an all-purpose equilibrium selection device, okay? What it's doing is it's saying there is, it's telling you, it's a conditional prediction. It's saying when you think that the common knowledge of rank beliefs assumption is reasonable, then it will give rise to a certain prediction, okay? Understanding these properties of rank beliefs is something that I think uh, should be tested. I'm talking to people about it, but um, yeah, okay? So I think that one should directly evaluate assumptions about rank beliefs uh, in the lab or in the world rather than taking seriously the asymmetric information stories where there's common knowledge of the structure of signals that we feel obliged, you know, Hyun and I, when we first started writing these papers, we feel obliged to give an asymmetric information story because it makes it sound more uh, kosher, but maybe we should just directly work with rank beliefs, take that as a primitive. There's nothing, you know, Hassani has said there's nothing better about doing it other ways uh, than you should do. Okay? And it, it's actually also interesting to, um, uh, so, so, you know, seeing what happens with different rank beliefs um, is also an interesting question, and a recent paper with Mohammed in the AR does that. Okay. So, um, and to conclude about incomplete information, um, we're so, you, you know, Hassani said you can use type spaces to represent everything. He said you can think of nature choosing at the beginning of the game the state of the world, and then every, everybody understands what happens after that. But we've become, but it really is, a, you know, to the extent that you use these models, but you're really using it as a, uh, as a metaphor, okay? It's not really the case that players have observed signals. You're using type spaces to capture situations of incomplete information that don't have physical counterparts of players observing signals. We should be more aware of the fact that we just have this metaphor ingrained about a true draw of your signal. Um, and uh, be careful, okay? And it is, it is interesting and insightful to consider relaxing the implicit common knowledge assumptions. I talked about coordination games today. Uh, lots of work on informational robustness in games and mechanisms is kind of going in the same direction. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. So I understand it's been a very long and dense uh, uh, productive day today, but uh, according to the uh, schedule, we have a few uh, minutes. If anybody has uh, questions about the content of the lecture, about the trade-off between making weaker assumptions about what people know and potentially demanding stronger assumptions about their ability to reason. But in particular, at the, uh, at the end, you were saying maybe we should test common knowledge of, uh, of rank beliefs. You really mean testing the common knowledge or simply testing the, com the rank belief? I can, I can see it is very plausible that someone doesn't know whether others are more or less optimistic than themselves. But again, it seems much more demanding if you're testing that they have that belief and they have a belief about what the others believe and so forth and so forth and so forth. Uh, yes, I agree. So actually, I was thinking of 
you know, in principle, I could test, yeah, so that would be, you would need extra implicit assumptions to test it. So what I'm thinking is that you could test uh, through time at moments when you're, you could look at a cross section and you could see, you know, is it the case that when you're more optimistic, how, do you, how does your rank belief change as you become more optimistic or as you become more pessimistic and that if it wasn't changing, I would use that as a justification for common knowledge of rank beliefs. But it wouldn't really be directly testing common knowledge of rank beliefs. It would just be showing that the level of your belief was not changing your, um, your rank belief. Thank the speaker again for his.